and um, Carrie, my sister, you know, we have, a, we have a better relationship at this moment. We work together actually at the doctor's office. She was the receptionist and I was his nurse. She came up to me and she goes, hey, there's this man named Gabriel and he's having a Bible study every Tuesday if you wanna come. And I was like, yes, absolutely. And she showed me a video that he made on fornication and all this stuff. I was like, oh, that stuff's wrong. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> duh. <laughs> Anyways, um, and I remember I went to the Bible study and that's where I was actually taught the meat of the word, which was, um, the truth. Yeah. I mean, first Corinthians six, nine through 11, where it states that, um, no, you not that don't fool yourselves. Don't you know that those who commit fornication and idolatry and drunkenness and, um, all these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't know it verbatim, but it's first Corinthians six, nine through 11. Please look it up. And it's right there. And not only there, it's everywhere it's all over the word it's all over her it's saying don't you know these will not inherit the kingdom of god galatians 5 19 through 21 it says it again um and i never knew that i was like i just thought we had to believe in jesus and we're saved no so at that moment i instantly decided to repent I repent. We, I never was taught repentance <laughs> growing up in a church. I, I was never taught you got to turn away from sin. I, it was just, oh, his, his uh, mercies are new every morning. You keep sinning. No. It, it, I, at that moment when I became aware, oh my gosh, I'm going to go to hell if I keep living my life the way I'm living it. I got to change. And instantly I broke up with my boyfriend at the time. We, I never was taught repentance <laughs> growing up in a church. I, I was never taught you got to turn away from sin. I, it was just, oh, his, his uh, mercies are new every morning. You keep sinning. No. It, it, I, at that moment when I became aware, oh my gosh, I'm going to go to hell if I keep living my life the way I'm living it. I got to change. And instantly I broke up with my boyfriend at the time. We were living in sin. I just straight up was like, I'm sorry, unless we're going to get married. And this is girls, women, this is the best way to weed them out <laughs> to those who are truly wanting something. Give yourself a good godly man that seeks the Lord first. Um, and I told him, I said, unless we're going to get married, I don't want to. I'm waiting and he goes oh no i'm good peace out i'm like okay and i was so okay with it because i was like god i'm gonna seek you first now seek me first seek my kingdom my righteousness first and all these things will be added unto you because I, I i seeked him first and now i am happily married to my husband we have bible studies every saturday night at 7 p.m for anybody if you live in the texas uh houston area uh, please message me and I'll give you the directions. I'll give you the address to the Bible study if you're interested in that. And now we have a baby boy. Pick up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. He says that many, many times in the word. We have to deny our flesh. The enemy wants to make this world, wants us to think that we have to make heaven on earth. That's not, mm -mm. that's not biblical. The Bible says we're going to suffer here. We're going to go through many trials and tribulations, but take heart. If we are going to live for Christ, if we're truly going to live for Christ, we are going to suffer for his sake. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to be killed. But. We're going to have eternal life with him. You focus solely on the world and trying to make earth your home, earth your heaven. This is a temporary, this is but a vapor. Heaven is eternal. Store up your treasures in heaven. Seek him first 
then all these things will be added unto you. It is so true. I am a testimony to that. I had nothing. I had nothing. I felt like nothing. My God has showed me so much love that I never thought I deserved. So much love. And I am eternally grateful. And to share my testimony and the gospel to all who are willing to listen. Call on him. Call on him. Any struggle, any situation is not too big for him. We got a big God. <laughs> Our problems are like nothing to him. And if we do have problems, it's probably for him to shape us into what he needs us to be for his kingdom and his glory. And we're sitting here, why, why is this happening? But we're to praise him in the storm because we're to trust him in all things. If it's his will being done, it's his will. And that's what I pray every day. Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. So if I'm suffering right now, I'm going to praise him through it because if it's going to bring him glory, for he makes all things uh, work for the better or for the good of those who love him. So he uses all things for the good. And so it's just learning to praise him in the storm. He never left me. And he plucked me out of hell. He plucked me out of the fires. And I, he, I'm his now. I live for him. You see, he is giving a promise here about salvation. This salvation I have promised you, I will complete every word of it. But in America today, we have all kinds of people who are supposedly saved. But these very people never grow in grace. They never grow in sanctification. They're never transformed. They always remain the same, carnal and worldly. And they fill up our churches. They make up the majority of people in the churches. And that is totally foreign to everything the Bible teaches on salvation. Salvation is a past tense event in the fact that He has justified His people. But it is a present tense event in the fact that all those whom He justifies, He sanctifies. As a matter of fact, in the Scriptures, in true historical Baptist teaching, and in almost all true evangelical denominations, God's work of sanctification is the evidence that He's truly justified a man. There is no such thing as a continuously carnal Christian. It is not in the Bible. It is not in church history. It is a fabrication of American Christianity. And of course we have to have it because it's the only way we can explain that the great majority of most of our churches are carnal and worldly. Look what he says in verse 12. You will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. Instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up. And it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. What he's saying is, through this work of salvation, I am going to reverse the curse. Now this is not just talking about some future time. It's not just talking about some millennium. It is talking about also his work of salvation in the life of a believer. That when God does a work of salvation, it is not only going to produce a position before God, a position of righteousness and acceptance, but in this life, He is going to change them, make them His people. He's going to transform them with life and joy and righteousness and holiness. They are going to change. And why is that? And it will be a memorial to the Lord. Here's what I want you to understand. The work of salvation, the work of salvation has God's reputation riding on it. You go to Ezekiel 36. He says, I am going to save you for my own name's sake. And when I save you, the nations may not 
bless the work, but they'll recognize it and they'll know that I am God. You see, His reputation is riding upon it. And that is why when we have this doctrine that says God can partially save a man and cannot sanctify him because the man won't cooperate and cannot bring him into greater godliness and greater holiness and greater piety, what are we doing? We're trampling on the reputation of God. Salvation is a supernatural work of God. In the great, there is a great reformation going on in this country. It's not known by media or Christian media. But there is an underground reformation going on in this country of people who desire truth. Not new truth, old truth. But I, we need to recognize something. That even in the great awakenings, it was not just about God's sovereignty. It was not just about His providence. It was about the doctrine of regeneration. And this is what we've got to say. Now again, I'm stepping over the boundaries, but there's so much that needs to be said. You see, we teach the doctrine of justification today. But very few people understand or teach the doctrine of regeneration. You see, man only has two problems. One is, he is condemned in his sin. The other is, he has no power over sin. For the last generation in this country, they have taught that God, when He justifies a man, can save a man from his first problem. By justifying a man, when that man believes in Christ, God can put away that man's condemnation and the man is free. But we have lost the doctrine of regeneration. And we have failed to realize that if God has justified a man by faith, He has also regenerated that man by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that justification will make that man right with God by faith. But the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit will change that man and give him power over sin. If there is no power over sin in the life of the believer, he is probably not a believer. We have lost the doctrine of regeneration. When I look through Whitfield, when I look through Wesley, when I look through Howell Harris, Daniel Rowlands, on and on, I see something I don't even see among our reform guys today. And that is preaching the powerful, supernatural, spirit-driven work of regeneration. You see, salvation is not a decision. This is what my whole life is about. I'm not a good expositor. There's only one thing that's always on my heart. What does it mean that Jesus died? And how do men get saved? And I want to tell you something. We have turned salvation into a decision. If I were to dismiss this church right now and send us all out, we would find a multitude of people that have made their decision. And if you ask them if they're going to heaven, they will tell you yes. And if you ask them why, they will point to a decision. Because the hour of decision and all these evangelists making people make decisions. Salvation is not merely or primarily a decision. It is a supernatural work of God. When God created this world, He created this world creatio et nihilo, out of nothing. When He recreates a man, it's a harder task. Because He recreates a man out of vile matter. He takes a corrupt thing and transforms it. Most people today in our churches are lost. And they demonstrate that they are lost because their entire Christianity is nothing more than they made a decision. If you ask them, why, what is their hope within them? How do they know that they have believed? They've made a decision. They've prayed a prayer. They asked Jesus to come into their heart. But the evidence of true conversion is none of those things. The evidence of true conversion is if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things pass away. You say, Brother Paul, can Christians sin? Christians do sin. Can Christians fall into heinous sin? Yes, they can. They cannot stay there and live it as a style of life. Because God will not allow it because He is a good Father and because His reputation is on the line. 